the mm, gurus. gurus. They've been up to many things. And one of the things is that it seems some of them have wittingly or unwittingly been serving as propaganda outlets for Russian state media. <laughs> And this concerns the story around Tenet Media, a American self-styled, you know, heterodox, but actually right-wing, alt-right outlet that had Lauren Chen and Liam Donovan were the two people who founded it ostensibly. And they in turn hired people like Benny Johnson, Tim Pool, Dave Rubin, Lauren Southern. But according to the United States Department of Justice, this was actually an operation funded by the Russians, yeah. uh, kind of via Russia today. There were operatives in the US not disclosing their affiliation. There were people created characters, fake founders, and there were various marching orders sent. And so like the, the, some of the people like Tim Pool and Dave Rubin have essentially argued that they are victims, victims of receiving huge amounts of money, <laughs> but that they basically didn't cater their material. They were just being funded for God knows why, whatever reason the Russian state would have for wanting to support them. But on the other hand, Lauren Chan, and her husband, according to the indictment, seem very likely to know where the funds were from because they did things like refer to the people paying them as the Russians and look up the time <laughs> in Moscow. And stuff when like they were they. trying to contact their mystery, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the mystery investor who is purportedly a Belgian, totally fictional character who is the apparent um, benevolent funding agency but of course it wasn't it was uh russia today and the, the amounts of money we're talking about chris so benny johnson would get uh four hundred thousand dollars a month in exchange for four monthly videos plus a hundred thousand dollar signing bonus tim pool also agreed to a hundred thousand dollars a video but he didn't get a bonus and uh, so poor negotiating skills there and you know one thing that tim pool and others have claimed it's like this is quite natural for them to be offered this kind of money for, to produce that kind of content. Nothing suspicious about it whatsoever. But of course, these videos that they were creating on demand were just, you know, were getting actually attracting extremely low numbers of views. And the amount of money that they could possibly have made in revenue from that content would have been like 50, 100 bucks, maybe. <laughs> and they're getting paid $100,000 for it. But they didn't, they didn't notice anything suspicious about that. Yes, I saw figures of 10 million in total being funneled into this company and various commentators receiving, you know, $400,000 a month. So yes, and the two ways that you can look at it is that if you buy that Tim Pool and Dave Rubin just were completely tricked by Lauren Chen and they didn't find it that suspicious because they often get offers like these kind of large payments or whatever. In that case, it means that they were identified as people that were promoting messages that the Russian state were happy to have amplified or like that they wanted to encourage. And that's not a great, that's not a great look for somebody that people that try to present themselves as fearless, independent voices that the authorities are, you know, afraid of. That if the authorities happen to be Russian, <laughs> interested in sowing discord in America, then you are the kind of voice that they want to amplify. So even in the best case scenario where, you know, they are just unwitting idiots who don't look into any details because they're getting absurd sums of money in general. Yeah, it's not a great sign for their content. And the other view is that, you know, they did know or had some suspicions and didn't care or were happy to go mm. along with things. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, if, if you look at the talking points, the kinds of uh, material that Russia Today wanted the stable of influencers to promote, it was things like, you know, everything's going terrible in the United States, you know, universal poverty, halting of economic growth, but a lot of focus on white Americans in particular, risk of job loss for white Americans, excessive privileges for people of color, perverts and the disabled, constant lies of the Democrat administration about the real situation in the country, threat of crime coming from people of color and immigrants, including new immigrants from Ukraine, overspending on foreign policy, 
at the expense of the interests of white US citizens. It goes on. But last but not least, America is suffering a defeat in Ukraine, uh, despite Biden's efforts. We are being drawn into the war. Our guys will die in Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, you know, not yeah. really, you know, stuff that's pretty clearly in Russia's interests, not, <laughs> not in <laughs> America's interests, I would say. Well, there's also some instances in the indictment that mentioned, like one of them was commentators being asked to promote this alternative conspiracy about an attack in Russia, which was carried out by ISIS or ISIS uh, affiliates, um, and they wanted them to push the possibility that it was actually an attack linked to Ukraine and America, of which there was no evidence for. Or that very sycophantic video that Tucker Carlson put out about the Russian supermarket. They wanted that <laughs> promoted as well. And actually, in the indictment, one of the commentators said, this feels a little bit on the nose, you know, like a little bit. Like, <laughs> well, I think the phrase was, this is too obviously shilling. <laughs> yeah, but but in the end, agreed. Like the the, <laughs> the response in that exchange was, well, no, the, you know, they think it would be okay. And the, the commentator backed down and, and said they'd be willing to put it out the next day. So like, it's, it's really very, the kind of classic clandestine operation to influence a foreign government in a it undermining way. Like it is Cold War shit, right? Like, yeah. and I mean, it's also been going on in general in the modern era, but this is, this is very much the Russian media playbook, you know, like Putin's fire hose of like bullshit, right? Just pump on yeah. disinformation that aligns with Russian interests. And yeah, it's not surprising but it is surprising that we now know about it and that it's like the specific amounts are being revealed and so on and that there are these high profile figures that have been identified in it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the general aims of this kind of um, information warfare are twofold. One is they want to... They want to sow division and social instability in the United States. Obviously, they've identified the kind of white anxiety, uh, for want of a better phrase, and you know, and also the culture war topics around sexuality, etc., crime. So you know, they identify a gap, and it's the crowbar to try to increase those divisions. I mean, the Americans are doing a pretty good job of <laughs> amplifying the divisions all by themselves without Russia's help, but they do want that. And of course, the second thing is to advocate for an isolationist foreign policy on the part of the US, you know, promote conspiracy theories about Ukraine. And, you know, this is very obviously in the interests of, of Russia and other foreign powers. Before we go on, Chris, maybe we should play an example of a clip which maybe illustrates why someone, uh, these influences <laughs> might be um, preferred uh, funding targets by uh, Russian media. Sure. And I have a clip which is from Tim Pool, which is a right-wing pundit who claims to be a centrist, non-partisan, whatnot. But the salient point here is that he has claimed that he was not influenced in his content at all. So according to him, this is purely his own opinion, right? His own outlook on the conflict in Ukraine. And let's just hear a little bit about that. But I don't know that it matters anymore. This is psychotic. Ukraine is the enemy of this country. Ukraine is our enemy being funded by the Democrats. I will stress this again. One of the greatest enemies of our nation right now is Ukraine. They are expanding this war. Now, don't get me wrong. I know you've got criminal elements of the U.S. government pushing them and guiding them and telling them what to do. Ukraine is now accused a German warrant issued for blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline in triggering this conflict. Ukraine is the greatest threat to this nation and to the world. We should rescind all funding and financing, pull out all military support, and we should apologize to Russia. Apologize to Russia. A little on the nose. Yeah, <laughs> a little on the nose, especially in hindsight, knowing that he'd been paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by uh, Russian state media. And, you know, so that illustrates in pretty obvious terms why I think the Russian foreign influence campaign might be fond of Tim Pool. I mean, the other aspect of it too, of course, is the inciting internal divisions in the United States. And, you know, the kinds of things that these influencers talk about is, you know, about race, like this is some of the titles, like race is biological, but gender isn't, question mark, question mark. Trans widows are a thing and it's getting out of hand. Um, some of the most common three-word phrases include World War III, Black Lives Matter, 
diversity, equity, inclusion, and, uh, you know, stuff about racism towards white people, gay date, trans women, massive attack free speech. I'm reading from a wide, uh, quite a good article, actually, where they, they downloaded the transcripts from uh, a bunch of the material that these influences were created and they, they did a content analysis. I see, because I just that sounds like, you know, standard culture war <laughs> it's, uh, stuff on uh, the right. But, you, you know, the, the thing about that content as well, like it doesn't feel particularly authentic, you know, the kind of banging the fist on the table and people have pointed that out, but also like it doesn't even make sense saying that the Nord Stream pipeline explosion triggered the conflict, but that happened after Russia hmm. invaded. It's just a mishmash of talking points and rhetoric and that kind of thing. But again, Tim Poole is one of the people arguing that he wasn't told any talking points or things to say. So that's purely organic Russian apologetics to the extent that at the end of it, he says, you know, we should apologize to Russia yeah. for their invasion of Ukraine. So <laughs> so a lot of the discussion about this stuff has sort of hinged around this, this question of whether or not they were the unwitting beneficiaries of Russian state media support, the victims, as they claim, <laughs> of being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars each, or whether, in fact, there was some kind of editorial influence exerted. And I, I've got a little bit of personal experience with this kind of thing, Chris, in terms of the way in which money is used in an attempt to influence purportedly independent voices. So for instance, I wrote a, a paper some years ago that was dealt with uh, cigarettes and addiction and vaping. And just from that single paper, uh, I started receiving letters from Philip Morris, the big international tobacco conglomerate, you know, saying, you know, very vague, vaguely worded, but along the lines of, we really admire your work. You're doing important stuff. We would love to get together and have a have a meeting to discuss, you know, ways in which we can cooperate. And I actually received phone calls from them as well. Interestingly, of course, not from um, the phone calls were not from Philip Morris themselves, but actually from a guy who represented some organization. He wasn't at liberty to divulge which specific. Uh, tobacco companies his organization was representing. So he, basically a front person, right? So I played him along a little bit because I was just curious in terms of how that stuff works. Needless to say, of course, I have never taken a, a single dollar from uh, any of those people. Same thing with gambling. There's a lot of money involved there, a lot of interests at play. What you'll see at, at gambling conferences and regulator conferences is very nice young men wearing very nice suits with big smiles and firm handshakes and nice business cards who are, are, are really keen to um, make contact, really admire your work, which is unusual given that it, when your work is very highly critical of the gambling industry. But, uh, you know, again, just opening the door for opportunities to collaborate. And the vast majority of researchers do not touch any of that money, but obviously with tobacco, it's quite famous that at least a few medical researchers have and the same thing with gambling researchers i won't name names but there are gambling researchers who take very large checks from um, organizations associated with gambling who purportedly just want to support gambling research would not dream of influencing their research or influencing their opinions in any way shape or form i am sure uh, it just happens to be just and just like tim pool it's just a coincidence that those researchers tend to find stuff which is uh, you know more, more broadly in favor of of more liberalized policies towards gambling so my point with this is is that there is a big gray area in terms of the way in which money can influence people it's usually never so crude as here's a brown paper bag full of cash and you need to say x y and z on this thing um it's much more subtle than that you know i think it's a real problem i think so much of the, of the dis discussion about free speech and you know heterodoxy and you know independent commentators out there with, with their independent views let a thousand flowers bloom that's incredibly naive when you know you and i through the podcast have gotten a sense of of the kinds of ways in which people who are kind of hungry for more profile and hungry for money, for income, are quite susceptible, I suppose, to various forms of payments and support. And, you know, that isn't always divulged and made completely transparent to the people listening. So I, I think this particular scandal here, it's obviously at the extreme end where you have Russian intelligence uh, agencies, you know, funneling money to influencers. But I, I think it's indicative of a much broader problem and I think people should just have an awareness that often what appears to be an independent voice 
can often be a mouthpiece for propaganda. And it, it made me think of characters like Bjorn Lomberg, who, you know, is is this famous uh, climate change contrarian, has these, you know, independent think tanks, independent institutes, which purportedly is offering a fresh, independent perspective about climate change. And of course, is finding that, uh, oh, you know, it's all overblown. It's all scaremongering and so on. Um, it, it's, there's really not much point trying to adhere to like a two centigrade uh, limit on the increase in climate. But, you know, is paid a very huge amount of money. I think in, in one of those years, the financial document said that his personal compensation package was about 760,000 American dollars. It's a pretty good mm. that's a pretty good salary and the activities of these you know you know research groups or think tanks is pretty much all about propaganda like it's all about pushing a particular line and if you look at the funders then they they tend to be strange capitalists like like very wealthy right wing individuals who've got an interest in this kind of thing and um, and lots of connections to the energy companies as well so yeah you know I, I think the takeaway from this is for everyone to be just a bit skeptical about the so-called independence of of a lot of commentators and we should be demanding a lot more transparency about where people are getting getting their sources of income from yeah actually i remember doing a little bit of a dive in the bjorn Lomborg's Copenhagen consensus think tank and i find the reporting of their finances from 2020 to 2018 right and his salary uh, his salary was between 500,000 to 750,000 dollars per year and that was by far and away the main expense right that was in the financing for the the group so i wonder are there comparable non-contrarian environmental groups paying, you know, such a salary to people just talking about, you know, the actual research? If so, I'm not that aware of them, but but maybe there are. But yeah, so actually there's a clip of Tim Pool where he's talking about this kind of influence operation, right? And how people don't have to be given specific instructions in order to promote a particular narrative. So he is aware of it. <laughs> it's just seemingly it doesn't apply to this circumstance, or maybe it does. But in in any case, like yes, it's uh, it's an issue, and it doesn't have to be as blunt as somebody with a Russian accent wanting to hand you over money in a briefcase. But in this case, some of the details do involve <laughs> like people putting on fake accents, making up. <laughs> like fake name people and stuff so that's quite remarkable and also remarkable is like there's a whole host of heterodox figures who will leap on any conspiratorial sniff of information exclusively if it comes at the expense of like the left wing or the democrats or this kind of thing right hunter biden all of that that's that's like hugely significant but as people have pointed out the specific amounts here involved dwarf those in the Hunter Biden scandal. But figures like Eric Weinstein, you know, the usual commentators, remarkably silent or very willing to see the nuance in this situation. And we shouldn't be too hasty to condemn, you know, people who uh, don't, it's unclear that they did anything wrong. So it's just that double standard that like people claiming that, oh, they demonize conspiracy theorists. They're interested in looking at state warfare and all. Just suddenly not particularly interested in this very (laughs) on-the-nose example of an actual conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got into trouble ages ago a little bit with you, I think, because I referred to, like, real conspiracies as, like, mundane conspiracies and how they have, like, very little interest in them and and you know it's a bit misleading that word mundane but i just mean like the real (laughs) things that happen in the world right and they just have no interest in investigating them that there is zero outrage so it is it is disappointing but not surprising you know there's a wide range of ways in which people are motivated by the source of their funding we've got this dimension on the gorometer called excessive profiteering or grifting and and this is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. We're not talking about making money. We're talking about making money in underhand ways. And it could be 
like literally taking money <laughs> from Russian government, or it could be taking money from a sponsor who wants you to say good things about their supplements and you don't make it clear that that's an ad read. Like the diary of a CEO guy who was on the executive board right, of the companies that he's reading ads for um, and giving testimonials for. There's a conflict of interest there that is transparent to a toddler, but apparently, you know, escapes the mind of somebody interviewing CEOs. So, yeah. yeah. Now, now the, the thing that, 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 you know, researchers know is that the only sensible approach to this kind of gray area is to be very stringent about your rules for accepting money, right? And, you know, waving your hand and saying it has no influence is is really not good enough. You actually have to have good principles from what sources of funding you will accept and you should be transparent about them. And that's why uh, researchers like you and me, when we publish articles or we apply for grants and things like that, we will, as a matter of course, often document every single source of funding uh, for research that we've taken. And, you know, I'm very glad to declare every single funding source, for instance, that we receive for doing Decoding the Gurus, because it's very bloody simple. We, we get money from, from from Patreons, most of whom are paying $2 a month to listen to this nonsense, and we thank them for mm. it. And we get a tiny little bit of money from YouTube, um, the, you know, the automatic ad revenue thing. for AdSense. Some, AdSense. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Well, yeah, we did have advertisers. <laughs> well, we on a time like for, grand use. Uh, grand use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did, did they ever yeah, pay us? I'll did look, they ever pay us? I weird. think they did. I think they did. But you know, if you hear us reading ads, it's very clear because we put little ad music on and whatnot, and we've never said anything that we feel is degrading of our like morals, right? Like we wouldn't chill for something like AG One. Or whatever, unless they offered us one million. <laughs> no, no, not even that. I'm just joking. But it is about transparency. Though I will say, Matt, that like there's plenty of academics who, yes, usually people disclose their funding sources, but I just know a bunch of things where people have not declared conflicts of interest and the really extreme <laughs> conflict of interest. And like it's only when they get called on that that they end up having to add it in or, you know, it becoming an issue. So it's all voluntary. And yeah. I think the majority of people behave ethically in regards to that because they don't have anything to hide. But the people who actually have things to hide are often the ones that like don't disclose yeah. these kind of things yeah. without pressure. So, but, yeah. But but you see how it works, don't you? Like in the same way that a company like Philip Morris, right, is just going to be scanning the research literature, pinging papers that are connected to their issue of interest, right, smoking an addiction, cancer, whatever, and then, you know, sending out this broad net, which included me, to sound out people whether or not they can be brought into the fold. Um, and, you know, they obviously start off with people that have a shared view, I suppose, you know, just uh, about the issue. And and then through the funding, solidify that kind of relationship. And you see exactly the same thing happening with the activities of Russia today with American political commentators, right? They didn't pick Tim Pool randomly or Dave Rubin randomly. They did their survey. that They, they identified the kind of people that, that are uh, on board with the kinds of narratives they want. And then they set up just like Philip Morris did with the nice phone call I got from that guy who was representing a, a group of undisclosed companies. They set up a, a front organization. So there's, there's plausible deniability, um, hopefully. Uh, not in this case. They didn't manage it. But usually there's plausible deniability. And yeah, the only, the only solution to it is for there to be just much more transparency and, and people demanding like clear answers about, okay, who funds you? <laughs> like, cause, because it is an influence. Like, even if you have good intentions, this is why we're very careful about, about where we take funding from uh, as researchers, even if you are not corrupt, even if you have good intentions, just by human nature, if you are reliant on large amounts of money from a particular source, then you are going to be, you almost can't help but be influenced in terms of not wanting to make your funder unhappy for fear of of cutting off this flow of income which is very important for for your very very important research and i i think the same thing is true uh of um you know online independent broadcasters content creators like they may well tell themselves that oh they're, they're not being influenced you know they've got the highest standards they're just taking this money because it's because they're supporting my very important work but 
you know, it's it's naive to think that it 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 does not cause influence. So even organic sources of revenue. So for instance, you know, getting paid by YouTube clicks and whatever. I mean, that obviously incentivizes people to make clickbait. There is always an influence uh, in terms of the kind of revenue that comes along. I, I personally think that a sort of a, a, a like a reasonable subscription type model where your audience is donating a small amount of money is one of the better ways for someone to be funded because it's it's clear and transparent and doesn't incentivize the worst kinds of behavior. But um, I think the main thing is to be transparent about where the money's come from because it always has some influence. Yeah, I think in any case, if you build an audience that is polemical and you're feeding polemical content, to them you could be getting small donations and have a whole bunch of things so i don't think it's any guarantee that no. a crowdfunded small donation model will lead to like not pandering or clickbait style content no 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 absolutely not no no i'm not saying that i just i guess the main thing i'm saying is that there's always going to be some influence, even even if you try to minimize it. But I guess the important thing is for it to be transparent so that people can judge for themselves the degree to which the influence might be at play. Yeah, I sign off on that. I sign off on that. Greater transparency. Sounds like the <laughs> application crisis, the open science movement. So let's, let's do it. Transparency for all. 